Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the second talk of Berkeley Labs uh, Summer Lecture Series, which is uh, brought to you every year by the Labs Public Affairs Department. My name is Dan Croats with the Labs uh, Communications Department. And uh, today we'll hear from Kurt Oldenburg, who is the head of the Geologic Carbon Sequestration Program in the Labs Earth Sciences Division. Uh, CO2 capture and storage involves the uh, capture and transport of CO2 to geologically favorable areas where it's injected underground for permanent storage. Uh, Kurt has been working on the latter part of this stage, the actual geologic carbon sequestration part, for about 10 years now. And today he'll discuss the challenges, opportunities, and research needs of this innovative technology, which has the potential to help curb global warming um, and which needs additional research to guide its implementation. Uh, he received his PhD in geology from UC Santa Barbara <clears throat> in 1989 and has been at Berkeley Lab since 1990. His area of expertise is numerical model development and applications for subsurface flow and transport processes. And he works in three main areas of geologic carbon sequestration. Uh, CO2 injection into depleted gas reservoirs, surface leakage processes, and risk assessment. Um, Kurt is also a contributing author to a chapter of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's special report on CO2 capture and storage, which shared the 2008 Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore. Please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Kurt. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Uh, can you hear me okay, everybody? Okay, thanks. So I'm sure uh, every one of you is aware of the problem of uh, CO2 concentrations increasing in the atmosphere due to our use of fossil fuels. Uh, many of you are also probably aware of some of the things that we can do to uh, help alleviate this problem, such as uh, switching fuels, using more natural gas, using more renewables, uh, certainly uh, increasing the way in terms of the efficiency that we use energy. I'm going to talk today about another approach, a very direct approach uh, called geologic carbon sequestration that captures CO2 directly from point sources and injects it into the ground. So an overview of this talk looks like this. I'll start out just motivating. Um, come on in, everybody. There's a lot of seats down in front. I'll start by um, <clears throat> just sort of summarizing uh, this energy climate crisis that we're facing and uh, look at our sources of CO2 and our sources of energy. Um, I'll focus most of the talk on geologic carbon sequestration. Uh, that's one element of carbon capture and storage, which I'll explain. I'll discuss the processes of capture, the processes of storage, I'll uh, show you that there are ex actually examples of this being carried out worldwide today. And we'll have sort of an emphasis on the scale that we need to uh, carry out this process to make an impact. Um, CCS is known to be expensive. I'll discuss what those costs are. They arise both in economic terms as well as in the possibility of some impacts due to the injection itself. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the research that we do here at Lawrence Berkeley Lab in this area and close with a uh, discussion of what's really needed in terms of leadership to uh, describe this process and uh, decide whether it is the one we want to choose. So the problem can be illustrated here in a nutshell through this figure. We've got sources of CO2 coming from the combustion of fossil fuels. They are emitting a large amount of carbon in the form of CO2. It's more than our terrestrial ecosystems on the continents or the ocean can absorb over the time scale that we're emitting it. So it's building up in the atmosphere. As it does, it causes global warming, causes climate change. What I'm going to talk about again are these sources and then this approach of geologic carbon sequestration. So let's look first at our energy use. This is uh, energy consumption uh, in the United States in quadrillion BTUs or quads. So it happens that we 
use about 100 quads in the United States. So you can look at these numbers in the boxes here as in the bubbles as percentages as well. And what you're seeing is that petroleum is about 40 quads, natural gas 24, coal 23. These are our fossil fuels. These are our primary sources of energy. Down here in these little uh, circles are renewables and nuclear. So we use more than 80% fossil fuel for our energy. Now there's a lot of information on this figure. I just want to point out a few things. First of all, the use of fossil fuels. Second of all, we're seeing here where that energy is used. So it's used for transportation, it's used for electricity generation, and it's used for some other sources. The tie lines between these show the fractions of the source and the fraction consumed. So in other words, 70% of our petroleum goes to the transportation sector, the transportation sector relies on petroleum for 96% of its energy. So this is a key one. It's almost all oil here in transportation, but oil is used in some other places as well. Let's look at coal now. 91% of the coal goes to the generation of electricity. The electric power generation depends on 51% of coal for its, its supply. So again, what we're seeing here is a very small contribution from renewables, a large dependence on coal, most of the oil going to transportation, uh, a lot of coal going to electric power generation, and electric power generation relying on coal. So how does this relate to CO2 emissions? What's shown here are uh, emissions on this axis. You can think of these as uh, uh, gigatons of CO2 um, with a few zeros removed. So what we're looking at, this is annual. This would be actually about two gigatons of CO2 per year. They did this in uh, these funny units, but think of this as two gigatons of CO2. We're looking at the source of CO2 coming from electricity generation and in coal there by that red color. Here's the transportation sector. Again, all of those emissions coming from petroleum. And you'll notice that coal and from the power sector and petroleum and the transportation sector are just about equal. We also use a lot of natural gas to generate electricity, so that gives the electricity generation the edge in terms of the source of uh, the production of CO2 emissions. But again, oil and coal are about equal. And what's kind of interesting here is you remember there was a lot more petroleum used than coal um, and uh, nearly all of that petroleum went to transportation, and yet the emissions here are about the same. Um, I just want to note one more thing, and that is that the, the sum of all these other things is about equal to each of these. So we kind of have one-third other, one-third transportation, one-third electricity generation in terms of our sources of CO2. So why, with these so equally matched, why are they so equally matched when their sources were somewhat different. Again, 70% of petroleum went to transportation. It has to do with energy content of these fuels. So shown here is, is just a little table uh, for hydrogen. We're looking at the energy content, 120 kilojoules per gram. Natural gas has a hydrogen to carbon ratio of 4 to 1, and it's got 51.6 kilojoules per gram. Onward to petroleum, a 2 to 1 ratio, 43.6, and coal down here with a one-to-one -one ratio of hydrogen to carbon, and it has the lowest energy content. So we have to burn a lot of coal to get the same amount of energy. That's why these emissions from coal appear to be, uh, or are higher. So what are these trends over time? Again, I mentioned the ecosystem and the oceans are not able to take up the emissions that we've been uh, producing. We're showing here now <coughs> emissions in gigatons or billion metric tons. This is now uh, for the uh, globally, and uh, sorry, this is uh, United States. No, this is globally. We're looking at uh, 26 uh, gigatons of CO2 per year emitted. That's been growing since 1900, rapidly accelerating here at the end, and the corresponding CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, showing really this, this uptick in the last 50 years or so, a real acceleration in the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. We're now up to about 385 parts per million by volume. You can see that the uh, sort of pre-industrial level was probably 300 or thereabouts. 
So we're really in an unprecedented regime here, looking at ice core records going back uh, 800,000 years or so. We're at the highest CO2 concentration uh, in the atmosphere that we've, that we've uh, ever had. So now I'll turn again to emphasize the scale of emissions. Uh, shown on the left here are figures from a very influential paper by Pakala and Sokolo where they tried to simplify this system to make it tractable and allow people to come to some uh, approaches that we might uh, have for solving it. So these are fossil fuel emissions on this axis. These are global. We emit about six to seven. Uh, this is gigatons now of carbon per year. We can always convert from carbon to CO2 by multiplying by about four. So this is carbon I'm talking about, about seven gigatons of carbon per year with projections in the future. So the BAU is a business as usual scenario. If we keep growing, keep producing power the way we do today, our emissions would grow along a curve like this. Uh, the lower curve is just a projection someone made if we were to uh, improve efficiency and do fuel switching and if we were able to reduce our emissions. And this is in fact the kind of trajectory we'd like to be on in order to mitigate climate change. Well, these curves are kind of complicated. What Pakala and Sokolo did is said, let's just linearize a lot of this. So they assumed going forward there would be a linear uh, increase if we did business as usual. And if we can avoid these emissions, so if we can do something to not emit in the future, the content essentially of that triangle, we could keep our emissions steady where we are today. We could keep our CO2 concentrations lower. Then they went further and divided this up into seven different wedges, they called them, or approaches that we could take. And again, the reason for this is that the magnitude of this problem is very large. We want to divide it up in order so that we can uh, solve it piece by piece. So each of these seven things here is called a wedge. And I'll discuss those a little bit later. But this gives you some idea of the magnitude of what we're trying to do, say, over the next 50 years to reduce our CO2 emissions. Now let's bring some of these big numbers. A lot of gigatons are being talked about here, a lot of large numbers. Let's bring it down, down to home here. Each and every one of us, when we burn gasoline in our cars, we produce about 20 pounds of CO2 for every gallon that we use. So if you imagine you're driving a, a low mileage car here getting 20 miles per gallon, the amount of carbon we emit is equivalent to approximately one charcoal briquette uh, every quarter mile. Or if you imagine you're driving at 60 miles per hour every 15 seconds, if you throw a charcoal briquette out the window, that's about the amount of carbon and the CO2 that you are emitting out the tailpipe. So this isn't someone else's problem. It's not caused by somebody else. We all are part of this. We're all producing CO2. So now the global fossil fuel CO2 emissions, I've mentioned this number before, are about 26 gigatons of CO2 per year. And then our US fossil fuel emissions are about six gigatons of CO2 per year. So you might keep these numbers in mind. Again, the US is a large fraction of the global uh, relative to our population. So let's look at gigaton. How, how big is a gigaton? Well, if we took the city of Berkeley here, this image, here's Memorial Stadium, LBL up here, just plotted a, a cubic kilometer box here, and we imagine that we filled it with water, that would weigh a gigaton. So again, water in this cubic kilometer uh, would weigh a gigaton. The world produces 26 gigatons of CO2 per year. Uh, if this were CO2, uh, at reservoir conditions, as I'll discuss later, uh, this box uh, would not quite weigh a gigaton, but it would almost weigh a gigaton. So how big is that? Well, let's think of something else that's a large number, like the population of the, of the planet. Let's assume we can squeeze six people into every cubic meter. If we squeezed all of humanity together, uh, they would actually fit into that cubic kilometer box. So we've got a big number of people. Uh, we've got this volume. Uh, and if we could fit six people per cubic meter, they would actually all fit in there. So it tends to be, again, a, a large amount. It's a large volume. Um, if you have any doubt about this fitting of the six people into the cubic <laughs> meter, uh, you can see that it, that it could be done. So it's a big volume. It's a big mass. <coughs> 
how does it actually scale to some other industrial operations? Well, shown in this table <coughs> are our point source electricity CO2 emissions in the United States. That's 2.4 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. Compared to the amount of water that we inject in the United States for oil and gas operations. Okay, so we produce oil in the U.S. generally from mature oil reservoirs. There's a lot of water that gets produced with that oil. Oil separated off and used and the water is re-injected. Well, look at that number. We currently re-inject three gigatons of water per year. So how does that compare uh, in terms of the volumes? Well, uh, if we used a reservoir pressure, uh, again, that's the place we're going to be putting, we think we can put CO2 that is very deep in the ground, we'd see that the volume of this 2.4 gigatons is 3.4 giga cubic meters. So that's a, a larger volume than for this water. Uh, so this is not as dense as the water at reservoir conditions. So if we just look at the ratios of those and normalize to the CO2, we see we currently uh, re-inject about 90% the volume needed uh, for the equivalent injection of all of our U.S. electricity CO2 point source emissions. So by this measure, it looks like it may be a bit more attractable. Um, now there is a detail, something that you need to consider here, and that is that for the case of uh, CO2 injections, it'll be displacing existing fluid. Uh, and furthermore, that CO2 is slightly re uh, buoyant relative to the existing fluid. On the other hand, in these uh, water reinjections and oil and gas operations, it's generally replacement of oil and water that's been produced. So there's some sense of a depleted reservoir and we're just putting something back. So we'll keep that in mind. Okay, so let me turn now to just what carbon capture and storage is now that we've looked at the scales. Uh, carbon capture and storage refers to the capture of CO2 from large stationary sources such as power plants and then the subsequent CO2 storage in the deep subsurface. This is the geologic sequestration part. So CCS involves two main processes. One is capture and one is storage. Uh, capture is currently considered to be the, the, the hard part, the expensive part of CCS. Whereas geologic storage is kind of the uncertain one, it's the one in which there may be some impacts arising, uh, there may be some issues of the scale involved, but generally we think we understand uh, what we need to, to, to begin this process. Capture, uh, to get the cost down, as I'll discuss, may require, or does require uh, a lot more research. So in terms of terminology, uh, you'll hear this called various things, carbon capture and storage, geologic carbon sequestration, geologic CO2 storage, geo sequestration, other things in different places around the world. Regardless of the name, <coughs> it involves these four basic steps. That's the capture from a source, the compression of the CO2 so that we can efficiently transport it to the place that it'll be injected, and then the injection itself. Now the main sources for capturing CO2 are flue gases, again from the combustion of fossil fuels, um, as well as, and as I'll show in a moment, the uh, processing of natural gas. So there's natural gas in the world, methane that contains a large amount of CO2, too much to sell to the pipeline, and uh, natural gas operators <coughs> will strip that natural gas of CO2, sell the methane, and in the old days, they would just emit that CO2 to the atmosphere. But recently, there are at least two projects worldwide where that CO2 is being re-injected. That's a geologic carbon sequestration process. So the first one I'll talk about is the Sleipner uh, project in the North Sea in Norway. This is a platform. It's offshore. They produce natural gas from a gas reservoir. And this has maybe 10 to 13 percent CO2 in it naturally, as the gas is produced, CO2 is stripped off, gas is sold to the pipeline, and the CO2 is re-injected in a shallower brine formation or an aquifer that no one ever expects to drink because of its quality. So CO2 is injected here. They've been doing this at a rate of a million tons per year since 1996. So this is an old operation. Um, I've described these processes. Basically, these kinds of operations had an economic incentive for them and so they did it. Uh, furthermore, Norway feels a lot of um, 
uh, obligation to deal with CO2 because they are a very large producer of oil. There's another project worldwide that's very similar. It's out in the uh, Sahara Desert in Algeria. It's a relatively uh, recent um, operation that's been developed out there. It's called the Ansala Project. They also produce a natural gas from a reservoir that's very high in carbon dioxide. Gas comes to the surface, the CO2 is separated out, and the CO2 is re-injected, only instead of above the gas reservoir, it's injected into what's called the water leg, or the non-gas filled portion of the same reservoir that contains the natural gas. So CO2 is injected here, gas is produced from there. Uh, <clears throat> this has been going on since 2004. Again, it's around a million tons per year. It's a relatively thin, actually, low permeability reservoir. They have to use some very long horizontal wells to get the injectivity, to get the CO2 into that formation. And it's a very nice test bed for some CO2 monitoring technologies, again, because we don't have very many cases of, uh, that we can study this process. So shown here is the gas reservoir outlined by that, these two dark lines. This is the gas reservoir. It's a doming structure. And the CO2 is injected in these blue labeled wells that again are in the water leg, so the surrounding down-dipped region of that doming structure. Okay, so where in North America are we going to be uh, looking to obtain or capture CO2. This is a map from the Department of Energy's NatCarb project. They have a very nice website, produce a lot of maps like this. <clears throat> what we're looking at is North America with all of the stationary point sources of CO2 from which we could perhaps capture CO2 indicated. I know these are very small. The yellow dots are ethanol plants. Uh, the blue ones are primarily the ones I want to sh show you are the electricity generation. So these blue circles, the size of the dot is some indication of the CO2 produced per year. Uh, you can think of a large uh, coal-fired power plant as producing about 8 million tons of CO2 per year. We have over 400 of those in the United States. But there's a lot of other sources, as you can see here, too. Um, sorry, you can't probably read this, but the red dots here are operations or opportunities similar to the two examples I just showed you of Sleipner and Insala. So it's gas processing where there may be a CO2 source that could be captured and injected into the ground. All right, let's go worldwide now. This is from the IPCC report. This is a table showing the number of point sources and their emissions. So worldwide, we've got about 5,000 point sources for electricity generation worldwide. Uh, cement production turns out to be a big source of carbon dioxide. There's over a thousand of those, many refineries, et cetera, down the list, totaling about 8,000 sources. In terms of their emissions, this is in million tons of CO2 per year now. So these sum to about 13 gigatons of CO2 per year globally. Recall the number I gave you for the total emissions of CO2 from fossil fuels. It's 26 gigatons. So the stationary sources are about one half of worldwide CO2 emissions. So this represents an opportunity. Again, it's very difficult to capture CO2 from a car or a truck, but it's thought to be much more practical from a point source. So about half of global emissions are from point sources. So how does capture work? Well, just some points here in terms of uh, coal plants. Pulverized coal or uh, plants are uh, burning the coal in air. It's heating water, making steam, and running a turbine. The CO2 is then exhausted in the flue gas, and that's typically at ambient pressure. The concentration of CO2 in that flue gas is about 10 to 15 percent. In the atmosphere, it's about 0.04 percent. So it's a big concentration, but it's still not a highly concentrated stream. And the way this is done is uh, by using aqueous amines, and it's illustrated here. <clears throat> we have a, a stripping tower. The flue gas containing the carbon dioxide enters at the bottom, and this amine solution enters at the top, uh, flows down as gas flows up. And uh, what happens is the amine absorbs carbon dioxide from that gas mixture preferentially. The other gases go out the top. The, uh, CO2 rich solvent then, it's, it's got zorb CO2, comes out the bottom and comes up into this tower, which is the uh, 
place where the, sol the sorbent is regenerated. And so now we have sorbent with CO2 in it being trickled down. And at the same time, it's heated. So CO2 comes off of that sorbent and is exhausted out the top to be captured and transported. So if this looks a little bit mysterious, this part of the process, this regeneration of the sorbent, is probably something every one of you has seen when you've taken a cold glass of water before you've gone to bed and taken a sip and set it on the night table there. And in the morning, it's got a bunch of little bubbles in it. That happened as it heated overnight and as air exsolved, analogous to CO2 exsolving from that sorbent. Air exsolves and the nucleus is a bubble on your glass. So this process is simply repeated with the regenerated solvent and uh, on and on. So that's the capture uh, process. Now before I uh, get into the uh, geologic storage part, which is really the focus of this talk, I want to describe the properties of CO2 because they're really key to this whole uh, idea. So this is a sort of a generalized phase diagram. We've got temperature on this axis, pressure on the vertical axis now. So we're increasing pressure downward, analogous to the way that uh, depth would increase in the Earth going down. So what you're seeing here are the different um, um, phases of carbon dioxide under different pressure and temperature conditions. We've got the gaseous regime here, the liquid regime, and then what's called the supercritical regime here. And all this refers to this word. It just refers to a material being kind of like the liquid and kind of like the gas and not easily distinguished. So what we see here for depths greater than a kilometer or so, um, temperatures are typically more than 40 degrees C at those depths. And so we're in what's called the supercritical region. And the carbon dioxide in this case is a very dense material, but it's not very viscous. So in that sense, it uh, is liquid-like, but in density and gas-like in viscosity. And we call that a supercritical liquid, supercritical fluid. Um, this, there's also the phase boundary here between the gas and the liquid, but there is no phase boundary out here. So these transitions from supercritical to gaseous going this way, or supercritical to liquid going this way, happen without any gross, big, large change in properties. They happen relatively smoothly. So also superimposed here are lines of constant density. So you're seeing here 750 kilograms per cubic meter. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So that's what I was saying earlier about it being um, very uh, efficient to store CO2 at depth because, in fact, its density is quite large, but it's not quite as large as water, so it will tend to be buoyant. It will tend to rise up. Okay, so with that summary of the properties, I can show then what the general targets are for geologic carbon sequestration or geologic CO2 storage. This, again, is a figure from the IPCC report. It's a cross-section of a, a sedimentary uh, basin. Depth is shown here, one kilometer, two kilometers. The first thing to note is that all of the targets, except for this one, all of these targets are deeper than 800 meters. And remember, that's sort of the dividing line between gaseous and supercritical CO2. So we want to be injecting deeper than 800 meters. Uh, the targets here, the first one they list is depleted oil and gas reservoirs. So that's shown here. We have a well. It's penetrated a structure that formerly trapped natural gas or oil. So that structure has a, a record of trapping a buoyant fluid and holding it there for geologic time. It's now been produced. It's depleted. It's available for CO2 injection and storage. Uh, let's go to the uh, third option here, the deep saline formation. So these are um, uh, aquifers, but they're very deep and typically contain salty water that is not drinkable. These can be offshore, as shown here, 3A. This is analogous to the Sleipner project I showed you. CO2 could be injected into this brine formation. Uh, they can also be onshore on the continents, again, injected into the brine formation. And these are considered to have the greatest capacity worldwide. So what makes an ideal sort of uh, uh, reservoir for injecting CO2? We want it to have a, a high permeability so that we can inject the CO2 and have it flow away without the pressure building up too high. We want it to have a large porosity so there's a lot of space down there for the CO2. And then we want it to have a cap rock. You'll notice these intervening layers here. These are the cap rocks. These are shales, typically very low permeability formations that are able to to trap the CO2 and not allow it to rise up uh, buoyantly. 
So those are our targets in general. Now I want to talk in general about trapping mechanisms. So I'll show this figure a couple times. What it shows is the percent contribution to trapping of four different primary trapping mechanisms. So these are structural and stratigraphic. That's the first primary mechanism. Second one is residual carbon dioxide trapping. The third one is solubility trapping. And the fourth one is mineral trapping. I'll describe what each one of these things is. Just note as time goes on after injection, the proportion contribution to the total trapping of CO2 changes. And in particular, the, the primary structural and stratigraphic trapping mechanism diminishes at the expense of these other two. So let's go through what these are. The first one is the most simple. Again, structural and stratigraphic trapping. It's what happens when a buoyant fluid, as we've observed with oil and gas, rises through a permeable formation until it can't go any further being trapped by a cap rock or a much less permeable formation. So this is sort of the fundamental concept many people have for a buoyant fluid becoming trapped. And this can happen both in a place where oil and gas was trapped as well as in a place where oil and gas had not been trapped. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment. The second one is this residual CO2 trapping. This is the most interesting, the most uh, compelling trapping mechanism, and I'll describe it here. This is a, a figure just representing the pore space of a rock. So we're down at a fairly small scale, 100 microns. This is called a pore throat and a pore body. Initially, let's consider this pore space to be filled with the brine, with salty water. Now we have a, boy, those colors didn't come out too well. There's an interface between CO2 and brine right here. And CO2 is being injected by somebody into the system, displacing the brine. <laughs> Gosh, can anyone see an interface there? This is going to be tricky to explain without that. Um, what I can uh, <coughs> tell you is that the brine throughout this explanation is the wetting phase. It wants to stick to the rock, and the CO2 is the non-wetting phase. So there's a film around the rock here, and the CO2 is not penetrating that film. As the injection continues, the CO2 fills these poor bodies and just necks through, barely filling another poor body. All the while, there's a rim of, of water, the wetting phase around that, that uh, distribution. At this point here, where we have CO2 connected throughout, we can establish flow through that, process, through that pore space just fine. But again, there's this light blue rim of uh, water around the edge. Now, if that injection process stops and the CO2 continues to move, say by a buoyancy force or by some regional uh, gradient allowing CO2 to continue to move, the brine now preferentially wants to come back in because remember, it's the wetting phase. So it gets pulled into these throats and it can just uh, continue to imbibe into that rock and actually uh, bypass carbon dioxide that's in the uh, circles. So at this point, I and mean, I'm sorry it doesn't show up better, there's a bubble of CO2 here and a bubble of CO2 here, and brine is making its way around those bubbles so that at the end we're, we're left with a connected path of water as shown by these arrows. So brine can flow through the system and the CO2 is actually trapped there. So that's the residual CO2 trapping mechanism. This happens after injection. This happens when CO2 is moving, say, by buoyancy by itself, and water is coming in at the tail end. And due to capillarity, it is uh, being pulled into the rock without discharging the CO2 that's already there. OK, let's look next at the solubility trapping mechanism. This one's very straightforward. We've all had carbonated drinks, so we know CO2 dissolves into water. This is showing, uh, as a function of depth, the solubility and mole fraction of CO2 in the liquid for some various different uh, salinity waters. So this is pure water here. So we can see that pure water dissolves a, up to a couple percent of CO2 and a brine a little bit less. But still, we're talking about percentages of the water that are capable of, uh, sorry, percentages of CO2 are capable of dissolving into that water.
So the solubility trapping mechanism is simply CO2 dissolving into water. Now, one of the neat things about this is that the density of that aqueous phase into which CO2 is dissolved is actually larger than without the CO2. So there's a tendency for that brine that has dissolved CO2 in it to move downward. And that's considered a good thing in terms of trapping. We're taking the CO2 further away from the atmosphere. That water will tend to move downward. As well, we get a little bit of a volume advantage because we're always looking for space in this process. So the higher density of the mixture is a good thing. Okay, finally, mineral trapping. Again, this is a complicated slide. I won't go into any details except to say that we do research on modeling the trapping of CO2 by mineral reactions. And this is needed because these reactions tend to be very, very slow. It's difficult to uh, do laboratory experiments on them. So this is showing a whole bunch of primary minerals in a rock, quartz, kaolinite, calcite, illite. It's subject to CO2 and water. And what happens is some of these minerals dissolve slightly, releasing some cations. And that can produce a secondary carbonate mineral, such as magnesite, magnesium carbonate. Or we can produce siderite. Or we can produce anchorite and dawsonite. And what these are, again, are considered to be the most stable forms of trapping of carbon dioxide. The crux of the issue, the problem is this is a very slow process. So it takes a long, long time to get this to happen. OK, so just summarizing on the uh, structures here. Um, the trapping mechanisms, we can actually say that we don't need a closed structure for CO2 to be trapped. So this is a section of the near Bakersfield of the Central Valley, and this is a layer here I'm outlining with the pointer. Uh, that's actually been proposed as a carbon sequestration site to inject CO2 into there. And there's no closed structure, and yet it's considered that as that CO2 migrates, it will in fact become trapped. OK, so the overall message here is that we understand these trapping mechanisms, and they're believed to become actually more secure as time goes on. OK, do we know, do we have some examples of this occurring? Um, in fact, uh, we store natural gas in the United States to smooth our supply and demand of natural gas. So um, when it, uh, say, in the summertime and places where we don't have a big air conditioning load, Natural gas is produced from the reservoirs at a constant rate, and we actually store it in over 400 places in the US underground, so that in the winter, when there's a heating load, or sometimes in areas where we have a high air conditioning load, we can produce it back very quickly. So natural gas storage is a, a proven uh, approach, and we know that the gas doesn't get lost down there. It's in fact trapped, and we can produce it back. So this is sort of an analog to the CO2 storage concept. So looking at the sinks in the United States, these are some sedimentary basins <clears throat> in blue and the oil and gas fields in red superimposed. So we're looking in the US at these regions as being very amenable to the idea of injecting CO2. And often they uh, coincide and uh, are very near existing areas of oil and gas operations. And that's good because we have a lot of information when we have an oil and gas operation there. There are wells. and knowledge of the region and knowledge of the subsurface. OK, so that leads us to capacity. This is now global from the IPCC report. Oil and gas fields are considered to have something like 675 gigatons of CO2 capacity. Remember, our global emissions from point sources are about 26. So this is a lot of years of capacity, and they could be a whole lot larger. And I mentioned earlier the deep sailing formations are considered to be have even more capacity. And, and it's very difficult to estimate, but it's considered to be a large, large capacity. So I promised to get back to the wedges. This is a wedge of Pakala and Sokolo. It's a 50-year offset of emissions equal to 25 gigatons. So you start a, a process, a technology at zero, and you ramp it up to be one gigaton of carbon per year, or about four gigatons of CO2 per year over 50 years. So remember, our, in the United States, we're at about 2.4 gigatons of CO2 per year. So if we could ramp up over 50 years to sequester all of that, that would equal one wedge. And again, this is uh, uh, for the solving the global problem. And it looks like oil and gas reservoirs alone could give us about 150-year capacity at a one wedge rate. Um, however, capacity is kind of an area of research. It is a function of injectivity and some other issues that we're working on.
uh, some of which I think I can talk about in a moment. Um, which thing? It was global. Oh, sorry. I think the, when I said us, I think I was talking about the U.S., actually. Um, let's look quickly at costs on CCS for various scenarios. Um, this is a cost curve. This is the CO2 captured and stored, again, in a million tons of CO2 per year. Um, <clears throat> this is the cost. And what we're looking at are various scenarios. I just want to highlight one or two. Note the first one here is actually a profit-making venture. This is where we had an ammonia plant, fairly easy to capture CO2 with an enhanced oil recovery opportunity. So the CO2 has value because you're enhancing oil recovery. This is, in fact, what has uh, spawned an entire industry for more than 30 years injecting CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. So that makes money. Everything else is expensive. Just very quickly on uh, scenario five here, a large coal-fired power plant that's not too far away from a deep saline formation <coughs> appears to cost about $50 per ton of CO2. So that would be the total cost for CCS. And how does this break down between capture and storage? Uh, that was scenario five I was showing you. Again, I'm sorry about these colors, but this right there is that light blue, <clears throat> and that's the capture part of that total $50 per ton. So most of the cost is in capture. That's why there needs to be more research in capture to try to bring that cost down. The injection itself is a relatively small part of the expense or considered as such right now. All right, let me, um, kind of trying to move along here. Um, I'm looking now, uh, we looked at costs in economic terms. There are also costs in environment, uh, environmental terms potentially because there could be some impacts from this injection. So what I've plotted here just qualitatively is the depth at which some impacts would occur and a very qualitative measure of the health, safety, and environmental impact. So right down at the <clears throat> place where we're injecting, there might be induced seismicity. So that's an impact, but it's not considered to be very large because these are, tend to be very small earthquakes. Now, I'll just say that uh, what's large and what's considered large are two different things, but uh, generally you wouldn't expect significant damage from uh, the sort of seismicity that we'll get from these injections. Then we have displacement of brine, um, <clears throat> intrusion of the CO2 into hydrocarbon reservoirs. That's considered an impact because it would degrade the hydrocarbons. Certainly intrusion of CO2 into portable aquifers or displaced brine into portable aquifers. We're all getting greater and greater impacts here up until at the surface. If we were to have leakage of CO2 right to the ground surface, that's where we could have a serious health, safety, and environmental impact. CO2 is a dense gas. <clears throat> its accumulation in a valley could lead to suffocation. Um, similarly in basements and homes. So these are considered the, the greatest HSE impacts. They happen shallow. Um, again, we don't consider any of this to be likely. Um, things happening down in the reservoir are more uh, important for us to look at. So I'll look at two examples here that we do research on, intrusion into potable aquifers and induced seismicity. This is the issue of groundwater quality. So we have CO2 injection occurring deep we have potable aquifers generally much shallower. There is a chance that there could be leakage along a fault or a well that would allow CO2 to enter a potable aquifer. The research that's going on is looking at how that slightly more acidic water with CO2 could behave in that formation. And in particular, it may dissolve some of the minerals that are present and mobilize some hazardous, hazardous constituents in those minerals, so degrading that groundwater quality. So this is research going on in our division. Similarly, induced seismicity is gaining a whole lot of uh, importance recently, a lot of attention. Uh, just shown here in general, we've got depth and pressure, just some basics about this. The pressure increases with depth as we go down by a hydrostatic pressure profile. <clears throat> if we don't exceed that hydrostatic pressure, uh, we will not inject anything. So injections of CO2 or anything occur at some pressure greater than the hydrostatic. And any time we're getting greater than hydrostatic, we actually have the potential to induce an earthquake to cause some shear failure. That's happening because the pore pressure is going up. The strength, the effective strength of the rock is less as the pressure goes up. So we can have some seismicity. 
This is a map from uh, <clears throat> last week showing earthquakes around the Bay Area. The magnitude shown by the size of the uh, squares here. Here we are in Berkeley. Here are the faults in the Bay Area shown. If you ever look at these in your newspaper, you'll always see this cluster up here at the geysers. This is a geothermal electricity generating plant, the largest in the world. They re-inject water to provide uh, uh, heat transfer for that system. And they uh, have a lot of induced seismicity there. They're very small earthquakes. But nevertheless, the people who live in that area are very concerned about these earthquakes and they, they don't like them happening. So that's what I meant by perception and as well as the actual damage that's done. Okay, so our program uh, in geologic carbon sequestration and the Earth Sciences Division, uh, our mission is to develop the knowledge and understanding of CO2 injection, storage, migration processes, impacts, and monitoring to inform and guide the safe and effective implementation of geologic carbon sequestration. We've been working in this area for about 10 years. Uh, we've published over 85 papers and peer-reviewed journals on the subject and been involved in the production of a lot of special issues and other documents. Our main research activities <coughs> are leadership and involvement in field demonstrations, that is injections of CO2, both in the U.S. and internationally. A lot of work on monitoring. This is essential to know where the CO2 is going, what the effects are of that injection, how can we tell where the CO2 is. Uh, model development and applications, for example, with the tough codes developed here at Lawrence Berkeley Lab for all sorts of the interesting processes and, and uh, reactions and mechanical effects that go on. Uh, as well, the uh, risk assessment, uh, laboratory work in terms of some of the physics of how fluids displace fluids at the core and smaller scales, theoretical studies of geochemistry, etc. Um, the lab has some new lab and UC Berkeley have some new energy frontier research centers focused on CCS. I'll talk about those in a minute. First of all, summarizing some prior work from our program. Uh, the Frio test was sort of a famous pilot in Texas. It was in an old oil field. We did simulations of the injection as well as analyses after it was carried out. We also uh, helped with the monitoring. This is a seismic image. This is the velocity change of the fluid and rock mixture showing the CO2 that was injected. So this is a CO2 plume here you're seeing in blue. And you know, this is really an amazing thing to be able to look into a, an opaque structure like the Earth seismically and to be able to tease out an anomaly that you can correlate with the presence of carbon dioxide. And this will be more and more important if we need to account and uh, verify geologic carbon sequestration. Okay, another very interesting monitoring uh, project <clears throat> has been looking at uplift at Insala. Recall this is the Algerian gas processing project where natural gas is produced from this area and re-injected in some horizontal wells in this area. What you're seeing here is synthetic aperture radar data collected from a satellite. Scaled here, the blue is five millimeters per year of uplift. The red is five millimeters per year of subsidence. So what's seen here is that the ground surface, 2,000 meters above the injection point, has deflected upwards at these rates just since 2004, since this injection started. It's about a million tons per year into these three wells collectively. So this was quite an interesting uh, phenomenon and <coughs> considered to be very useful, again, for monitoring where the pressure pulse is in the CO2 injection project. All right, very quickly on Energy Frontier Research Centers. One was awarded to Barrett Smith et al. on campus for capture and separations. And I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, they are looking at materials, membranes, um, going to use the nanotechnology to try to develop materials that are optimized for capture. On the storage side, Don DePaulo et al. Uh, in our division uh, received a, another award for looking at how to control the CO2 processes. So these include the carbonate mineralization. This is the mineral trapping mechanism I talked about. Uh, the transport of fluids at very small scale and then emergent processes. What might arise from sort of the combination of processes as CO2 is injected and occurs, uh, processes occurring over many scales. All right, so I want to finish up now <coughs> just to talk about uh, research needs. We, we need to uh, do site characterization, to understand the capacity where CO2 can be stored most effectively. 
monitoring, verification, and accounting. This word accounting comes up because in a cap and trade system or with a carbon tax, there's going to be a desire to actually um, hold the operator to knowing where that CO2 is. Again, if money's changing hands, they've got to prove that they have the CO2 and it's in the ground and not getting out into the atmosphere. Risk and impact assessment is ongoing work. The performance of these systems, optimizing these systems. We want to make sure we're um, injecting the CO2 and it's filling the pores as efficiently as possible. Um, unexpected consequences are there things we're missing, things that could happen that we're not anticipating. If they do happen, something we don't like, how can we mitigate it? What sorts of uh, corrective actions can be taken? So in general, we go by this sort of flow here where we find that the demonstrations and the field deployments provide us with a lot of information that feeds fundamental knowledge that then feeds back into the demonstrations. So we like to keep the circle going and keep very involved in both areas. The research that we're doing is to accelerate the safe and effective implementation. One could go out today and do much of this, but we feel the research is needed to really make sure it's safe and effective. So the message there is that uh, we should probably really get started with doing these things and learn by doing. There's nothing that's so irreversible. So to conclude, we have large point sources in which CO2 can be captured. Uh, we have geologic formations in which CO2 can be stored. The processes and mechanisms are understood. The capacity seems to exist for hundreds of years of injection. The capture is expensive. There's nothing free about CCS. Um, in addition to being expensive, there may be impacts from uh, injecting, but we think they'll be very limited and well-chosen sites. Pressure management may become necessary as pressures go up, the CO2 is injected and the due seismicity is a concern. We may have to produce back water to maintain the pressure. Um, overall, it looks like CCS is a sort of direct and effective way of reducing CO2 emissions. So you might ask, why aren't we employing, employing this approach now? Well, there's a lot of other issues. Regulations. Only in the last year or so have we actually been in the United States developing regulations that would even allow this to occur, and these have not been finalized. There's a lot of issues around liability and legal aspects. Whose carbon dioxide is it? If it does cause some problem, whose is it? Is it the one who injected it or the one, the power plant that it came from? The legal aspects extend to poor space ownership. We have mineral rights in the United States and we have property rights. It's never been decided that someone owns the space within the pores. So the state of Wyoming has actually solved this and they decided the poor space ownership goes with the property rights ownership. And so they're pushing that as, as being a reasonable approach, but nationally it has not been decided. Public acceptance, many people will be skeptical of something like this. Um, finally, the big one, actually probably the biggest, there is, there's no economic incentive. I've told you how expensive it is. Uh, <laughs> Who's going to pay for this? Well, what's um, desired is some sort of price on carbon so that there's a cost to emitting it. And what's in the cl climate and energy bill that's made it through the House of Representatives, that's sitting in the Senate, I don't quite follow it daily, um, but what's in there is what's called a cap and trade sort of approach. And that is a cap on emissions is placed and then allowances to emit are traded. So they have value. Um, companies will... Um, be able to uh, justify basically the expense of doing carbon sequestration because if they don't, well actually they cannot emit that otherwise. So the cap and trade sort of approach is one to give, to create an economic incentive for CO2 injection. So to make all of this happen, to get over these other issues, there's really a need for some strong leadership, I'd say both in the US and globally. Um, <coughs> there are high costs to carrying out CCS. These need to be explained to people and um, discussed and if they can be reduced, that's great. But we really have to compare in the end those high costs to the cost of doing nothing. And I guess just a final um, word on the cost is that when we started doing this work, these hundreds of billions of dollars and things like that seemed like big numbers. And with the recent uh, downturn in the economy with the stimulus bill and things like that, we're getting more used to these big numbers. So it may be easier to uh, allow this to happen.
Okay, I'll be happy to answer questions. Thanks. <laughs> We have uh, time for a few questions. Please raise your hand and uh, wait for the microphone. $50 a ton is equal to how many cents per kilowatt hour? Say that again? $50 a ton is equal to how many cents per kilowatt hour? I'm, I'm going to just have to generalize because I don't know the number exactly, but we're talking about probably a 40 to 50 percent energy penalty. So if you're 12 cents per kilowatt hour, call it 18 cents per kilowatt hour. We, we often couch this cost in terms of an uh, energy penalty. And uh, it's a significant energy penalty. Some people think it can be reduced, but that's sort of a, a safe number to give you. What sort of leaking uh, data do you have from the existing uh, the existing projects, and could you give us a more complete list of existing projects? We only saw you, you only you only listed one. Yeah, the um, of large scale industrial projects, uh, those natural gas processing projects are it. There are pilot projects that are you know large, but not as large as those. Um, I'd say that there is no um, data on any leakage from any of them because uh, none <coughs> has been observed. Um, where we can look at leakage is at natural analogs, um, at uh, actually man-made analogs as well, the natural gas storage industry. And there have been some cases of some um, things happening around faults at uh, at least one natural gas storage project. But again, it was mitigated, you know, observed and pressures were lowered and it was mitigated. So leakage, especially to the surface, is not considered a, a serious issue. Um, the primary risk factor for it is considered to be man-made wells. So the wells that exist in an area um, may be plugged, but the CO2 may actually react um, with well cement, CO2 and water, and create a, a pathway. So wells are considered one of the big uh, hazards. Um, the natural system seems very capable of containing the CO2 if it's injected deep enough under a cap rock. Is the uh, CO2 being injected as a liquid due to the immense pressure? Um, it's kind of a two-part question. <coughs> Is it being injected as it's, a liquid? I would call it a supercritical fluid. Okay. It may be in the pipeline formally as a liquid, but as soon as it's heating up, above 31 degrees C, which is not all that warm, it's super critical. Okay, and then due to that, is it feasible to uh, inject CO2 into like deeper oceanic regions because of the density, it would just stay at the bottom as a liquid? Or? Yeah, that was a, an approach people were uh, talking about several years ago and still do in some circles, but in terms of uh, the CO2 staying ponded at depth, it seems that the, it doesn't stay there very long. There may be ocean currents that allow it to mix. Now, more interesting is a, an offshore geologic option, mm -hmm. which is to put it um, kind of shallow beneath deep sea sediments. So you have the benefits of high density as well as the geologic formation, much shallower than what I've talked about, but nevertheless some geologic formation separating the CO2 from the ocean. So that approach is, is actually kind of promising, and there's a pilot proposed for the east coast of the U.S. that will try to exploit that. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Uh, right. uh, so CO2 storage capacity uh, underground, it's like a, it's a large number, but are we, t are we talking about how much and how long could it be a solution? Are we talking about 100 years, a billion years? <laughs> Hundreds of years is what what we think for the capacity. And then the CO2 that we put there will stay there much, much longer than 100 years. That's just the capacity that we have for the rate at which we produce it today. A question over here. Um, much as we, uh, the federal government may need to subsidize transmission lines for wind energy to get to the source or demand of the energy, uh, that incentive from the federal service, uh, government. Uh, would you give me a balance between geologic use within or near a coal-fired plant versus the options of pumping uh, CO2 to the major reservoirs like off the coast of California? 
and that maybe the fed, feds would want to incentivize a major pumping line and therefore take care of the liability as a federal uh, government rather than put that liability on individual plants. Or, uh, so what's the trade-off for geologic storage beneath the plants yeah. and our R&D knowledge versus transmission to large basins and having federal subsidies? Yeah, it, an interesting question. Uh, a little more on the policy side than I'm used to, but um, I would just comment that uh, there would probably be um, a lot of attractiveness to that, that is having some sort of uh, federal adoption of both the liability as well as the cost for creating the transmission facility. Now, um, <clears throat> it seems like in the past existing uh, power plants were not cited based on geologic storage capacity, certainly, so there would be the need for that transmission regardless. Um, an analogy you might uh, know about is the current CO2 pipelines that take carbon dioxide from natural reservoirs to Texas for enhanced oil recovery. So there are long pipelines already. I believe they were not subsidized at all, you know, run and operated by private companies. So either way, but I could see definitely that anything that alleviates the cost to the providers of this would be something attractive to them. And we have time for uh, one, one final question. Um, is there any research avenues or anything going on that involves both storage and fixation? Or maybe not fixation is the wrong word, but I know there's something going on with, with uh, exchanging methane hydrates for carbon, carbon dioxide hydrates. Is that, can they, and can they work yeah. at the same time? Is yeah. that even a viable? Yeah, avenue? what the, the, the question is, uh, has to do with methane hydrates and the potential substitution of CO2 for methane in a hydrate type structure. So there is some research going on uh, with that. Um, it's, uh, I'd say, a more, um, you know, sort of higher order next thing to be done. But again, in this field, we're always looking for the economic incentive. And so it may be that that could arise as being something attractive because there is the production of methane. Again, and it being a clean fuel relative to the other ones we use. You know, it can so. be done synonymously, like at the same time. Yeah, so the question is, can they be done uh, simultaneously? And I'd say that's the way it, it should be done, yeah. Um, I skipped over the coal bed methane uh, option, but that's similar to hydrates, where we have methane that's locked up in coal, and CO2 will absorb preferentially onto coal, releasing that methane, and that's called enhanced coal bed methane. So a very analogous procedure would be what you're talking about. A lot of details in there concerning methane hydrates, as you might imagine, just producing the gas at all. So. Uh, thanks again to Kurt for this interesting talk. It'll be uh, really interesting to watch as this research progresses. And join us next week for uh, the next talk on cosmology, on gravitational lensing. Thank you. Thank you.